everyone, this is Richard Blaze, and you're listening to Sean Rossler on the Course Grind Podcast. With you as always, host, creator, Sean Rossler. This is episode number 63 of the Course Grind Podcast. How is everyone doing this fine, fine evening? You know, I've been on a little bit of a throwback kick lately. It's uh, it's kind of a fun thing to see where folks are at as compared to where they were a mere year, year or two ago, which I'm learning in the culinary landscape can produce some pretty significant changes. But, you know, hooking back up with people, finding out where they're at is a really cool thing. It's gratifying. Uh, honestly, gratifying as hell for me as a host to see guests who, after I you know, get a chance to chat with them, continue on their upward climb to great things. So many talented people, it's so hard to not want to go back and speak again and again and again with them all. But when I read a recent story about a certain former Top Chef test and guest... I had to hear more about it and spread the word. Um, culinary school in Mexico City, Le Cordon Bleu to be exact, Thomas Keller, Jean George, and Mario Batali, they're all chapters of her accomplished history, which we've covered before, uh, coupled with the honor of being the youngest female executive chef in Los Angeles at 26. But with all this, in this recent article, she stated she didn't feel fulfilled. Now step back and think about that for a minute, to have all that and to say she didn't feel fulfilled, but then to find what fulfilled her. What's more amazing is the endeavor that she's transitioned to next. And those of you who know me know that one of the noblest pursuits I can think of is educating our children who are in all respects of the word, the future. So, uh, this chef is doing just that and I'm not going to babble on any further. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between my guest this evening, top chef season 13 standout, former executive chef of Pacific standard. And now the executive chef of the San Diego Jewish Academy, Chef Giselle Wallman. Chef, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is exciting to tell you about my new adventure. Yeah, it's so rad. And um, I know we were talking before the show. I came across it initially, not with the article, uh, but on a little place called Instagram. I'm admittedly new to the Insta thing. I I probably suck that way um, because I'm old now and I'm just coming into it. But it was really cool to see... Your new account, the Modern Lunch Lady, correct? Yes. So, it's my new account. Okay. Um, it's called the Modern Lunch Lady, and I thought it was really important for me to photograph my way into this new position that I have. Um, and I really do feel like I have finally found my niche and my calling, and I'm really, really excited. I feel like I'm posting something that I'm actually passionate about. Um, I had a really hard time, and I mean... I still have my Giselle at um, Giselleman dot or at Giselleman, mm-hmm. um, which I started to turn into a little bit more personal. I've I've always had a really hard time promoting myself, and I think that um, when you say you know I found myself unfulfilled, it's just that a lot of this is really promoting yourself. So now I feel like I'm promoting something that's way bigger than myself, and I'm really really excited about it. Yeah, it, it it really is, and I don't want to blow it up too much because I want people to go in to check it out. But uh, it, the, the random trades, okay, so um, folks listening to the show who really, let's be fair, are like my mom and maybe like two other people. No, I'm kidding, of course, but um, you know that I have three kids, and um, you also know if you follow my Instagram account that, you know, diet and fitness are relatively important things. I like to pig out just like the next guy, but let's be healthy about it. So one of the big hangups that I've had as being a school-age kid dad now, twice over, I've now got a fifth grader and a second grader, is that the school menu leaves something significant to be desired. And so from the pictures alone, I can see that you are doing incredible things um, for this place. And I want to talk about them and I want to talk about what you're bringing in particular. Um, But let's talk first about how the hell did you land there? What, what, how did you get from A to B? I mean, 
a pretty blunt question, let's be fair. But, I mean, yeah, what took you I from mean, Pacific Standard to the San Diego Jewish it took me. It took me a bit of time to get here. It wasn't just like I woke up one day and was like, okay, I'm going to go run a school. <laughs> right. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. Um, I moved down originally from Los Angeles back home to San Diego to find some balance in my life. I think, you know, as you all know, being a chef is an 80-hour week, and it's very stressful, and when you're not at work, you're still at work somehow because the restaurant never closes, and your staff is always, there's always someone working. And I think um, Pacific Standard was wonderful opportunity. Um, I have nothing but really amazing things to say about the company and working for them, but I think it was just the end of, you know, my, <laughs> I think I just kind of hit a wall. Um, I was, it was extremely fun. I had never opened up from ground zero, basically, to the first day, and that was extremely fun to watch the construction come up, come come forward, you know, but Mm -hmm. as soon as the day-to-day operation started, I just kind of felt like it wasn't fulfilling anymore. Um, The everyday stress of working a restaurant, something that I used to love, Mm -hmm. I didn't love anymore. I was having a hard time being inspired. Mm -hmm. Um, I was having a really hard time with the fact that, um, you know, we want to be very close to our farmers. Yeah. And we want to support them in every single way. But when you work for a hotel, you work through a big, large buying power. And, I mean, that's just the system. I, I get it. You know, it brings down our food costs. But 90%, I mean, it's like 80% of your food cost has to come from a certain vendors. And it kind of leaves your support away from your local farmers. And I, the more I thought about it, the harder... It just became more difficult and more difficult for me. Um, And one thing led to the other. And in April, I kind of just hit this wall that was like, I want to feel like I'm making a difference. I want to change something. I want to be closer to my local farmers. I want to learn about sustainability. I want to have, I want to learn myself about ecology and social, um, a way to be, socially economical, um, no, um, just (laughs) the whole world that I, you know, I've been cooking for so long that I just need to be part of this bigger picture and a picture that's bigger than me. And, um, so that was kind of in April, I decided to leave my job and kind of pursue that. Prior to that, in January, my mother called me. (laughs) My mother's been working at the Jewish Academy, um, for 19 years. And she called me around in January and said, you know, um, the school is kind of thinking about maybe looking for a new executive chef. And I kind of like rolled my eyes and was like, come on, mom. Like, I'm, you know, I'm top chef. I'm, I'm running a hotel restaurant. Like, what do you? And she was like, no, 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 I'm not calling for you. I'm calling like, maybe you know of someone. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, sure, you know, and. Uh, she said, and maybe you would like to meet and have kind of like a conversation and a, kind of like if you were just, you know, give your opinion about where the school could go. Right. So I kind of met with the school and um, thought about it. Mm-hmm. And the more I thought about it, I realized that it was kind of my calling. Nice. <laughs> but I was, it, but it actually, I did a lot of research to get to the day that I decided to take the job, which was in July. Um, I ended up going to different schools in San Diego and speaking with other chefs that run schools and the network of people that were kind of coming together was exactly the kind of atmosphere that I felt, again, inspired by and felt like I was part of a bigger picture and a bigger community. And I I grew up in a very strong community and the connection to these this bigger picture felt like a community that I wanted to be part of. And I finally said yes to the job in July and I've been there since. That's, that's amazing. I I mean, there's, there's, there's so much to sit back and and it's rare people that know me, know the show, know my penchant to ramble on at length. I, I don't think I've ever sat back and just listened and grinned ear to ear 
uh, to a story <laughs> like that in so long. But it is honestly, I, I'm I'm gonna call it sweet, and I don't mean for it to be disparaging or trivialize the 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 the, the transition. But it really is a sweet thing to hear that someone again with with as you know grand achievements as, as you've had now finds satisfaction and fulfillment in truly you know again I, I can't i can't tell you enough people that know me you know like yes we get it sean we've seen pictures of your kids shut up about it you know but like <laughs> kids you know kids are it man and to hear well, that kids are our future oh. and i think the important thing about this and the, the part that inspires me so much about it is that you know my parents and it's not their fault um i mean we just didn't grow up in that in the era of knowledge of what, of caring about what we're consuming and caring about where we're getting our produce from, you know, we are so used to walking into a beautiful supermarket that has beautiful produce and no one put any thought into what that meant and how that was hurting our food waste and how that was hurting so much of our, uh, our hunger in the United States. And this is all kind yeah. of coming to surface. Yes. And I think that's why there's been a huge shift in my career because, you know, as a chef, we are influencers of the buying power of food. Yeah. And um, to decide that we're not, that I'm not going to help my local farmers and to have, be part of a coalition of a support group and to teach the young generation that we need to make a change, you know, and they need to be part of it because, you know, I'm part of this like yoga box thing that, you know, you open a box and you get yoga clothes. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, I got pants last week or last uh, last time yeah. that are made out of 100% bottles, uh, like plastic bottles. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to work out with these pants that are 100% bottled water. And... That's why I think it's so important to start them young because I'm not asking everybody to learn about uh, food and education and nutrition because I I want them to be chefs, you know. I want them to be engineers, doctors, fashionistas, blah, 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 and so on, but be eco-friendly and to help your local consumers and to, you know, to be a lot more conscious of our world you know you, you, you want them to have something instead of just so yeah. hearing hearing you talk about that and the significance of the local farm culture which uh, again around our area central pennsylvania you can't throw a rock without finding a, a farm stand or two which is awesome it's, it's really cool um but the other thing that that brought to mind conversely is is what's termed ugly produce and i've recently learned of um, a movement and a program with one of our local grocery chains of providing the ugly produce to the community and to the food banks at, at a lessened cost. I imagine if you're educating them, I'm really on... happy that you're bringing this up, actually, because I'm working with a company here called Save Good Food, and I'm it. being able to serve probably ninety, let's say eighty, eighty yeah. percent local organic grown food to these children every day yeah. because okay <laughs> I'm serving around 80% local organic uh, produce uh-huh. and I'm getting this because I'm supporting local farms in San Diego I have a wonderful lady who has started an amazing program her name is Nav yeah. um, you can find her on Facebook she basically finds out and, and she's the communication with the farmers uh-huh. Um, she finds out what the farmers need to push, what they grew ugly, um, yeah. and I'm just going to quotation mark and explain what ugly produce is. I, I, I was um, I was just going to ask you for that because you know e- e- even even doing the show for four years, when I first heard it, I'm like, what the hell is ugly food? What do you mean ugly food? Then I found out the percentage so I, that gets dumped. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah. So go on, please. It is insane, but the best way for me to describe it is. You know that lemon tree in your backyard that produces the funkiest looking lemons, but when you squeeze the lemon, it is the best lemon you've ever had in your life. You know, or like you steal the, na- the lemons from your neighbor because they have this tree, um, or 
They just <laughs> East you know, Coast Pennsylvanians grow... translate that to peaches or apples, and we're good. Every, everybody will get it okay, that way. Okay, exactly. <laughs> so everyone has a pro. A, everyone has something mm-hmm. that they've seen their local someone, a neighbor, grow, and it just does not look like the supermarket. Oh. And the truth is that if you want to grow something organic. It's not going to look like this beautiful lemon that we see in the supermarket. It's going to have, um, I don't know if you know this, but the more marks on a watermelon mm-hmm. is the amount of times that a bee went and pollinated the flower. So it's actually not ugly. It just mm-hmm. looks ugly. And the watermelon is, I mean, delicious. Right, right. <laughs> so that's kind of ugly food. Ugly food is not grade A looking produce. That is completely edible, probably better than a beautiful looking something. Right. And I mean, I guess it just is don't judge its book by its cover. It's exactly what ugly produce is. And we should all get used to using it because yep. let's say a farmer produces 800 pounds of whatever, um, tomatoes, but yep. only 400 of the pounds are beautiful and are going to go to your local beautiful market. Mm -hmm. Well, if he doesn't sell the other 400 pounds, then he didn't really make his profit. Right. You know? Uh, So that's where Save Good Food and hopefully other people are coming in and saying, like, let me help you sell this. You know, if your tomatoes are too ripe, let me help you sell them. Let's get them out there. And um, this makes it really great for me because – at the end of the day, you know, I don't have time because I am still running a kitchen and I'm starting to start um, programs at school. It's great to have a produce company that just takes the time and does that for me and, you know, uh, gets it to me. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't be more happy with the alliance that I've made with Save Good Food. Yeah, it's it, 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 it's massive. And again, obviously, you know, the... the, the Things I've heard about it are, are minuscule compared to what you're doing with them. But when I found out that truly like 75, 80 percent of produce is getting turned away, I, I yeah. it, there's got to be something that goes off in your consumer mind when you hear that. So folks listening who didn't know con- that. As it, a consumer. Oh, oh sorry. I keep no, no, no. You off. Yeah, go, go ahead. I just feel like as a consumer, we aren't, we were not told this. We didn't right. know that. The bananas have to be within, I think it's like five to seven inches or something. And if they're bigger or smaller and they look beautiful, they don't make it to the store. Right, right. Or, or something silly like that. And you watch these documentaries and you're like, but I would eat them. So exactly. I think that that's why it's so important for me to make it to a school. Because I think that if the consumer was educated and learned to ask for for everything, I mean, and learn to be okay and learn to want it, then, I mean, we will make a change, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. And it, it, it's it, that's what I was saying before was that as a consumer, all you should need to hear is that once before you start going to your grocery stores and saying, what's your deal, man? Like, what do we do about this? How do we do this? There are people sleeping in cars, sleeping in boxes, sleeping in all these places that we could be feeding with this material there's so much that could be done with it and that should only make you want to as well part two focus more on your local farms local farm markets than giving into this corporate almost supermodel produce movement absolutely and we're getting there i mean uh, a good example of consumers being educated is the chicken industry in the united states Mm -hmm. that has changed dramatically in the last couple of years only because consumers starting started to want because they were educated cage-free chickens and cage-free eggs and now the consumer knows and now we have large companies that are making a change because the consumer and and big companies won't buy chicken that's not cage-free or that's not you know so i really truly believe that with education we will get there that's and that's just it and that's a perfect transition into all the more about what you're doing where you're at right now so you're educating these future bodies minds and souls not just not just to be chefs like you said but to be mindful consumers of 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 food i i i love it when 
um, my my dear friend Chef Gary Vatican here at Seasons on Main in Bloomsburg, we will periodically take our now ten and seven year old uh, down to dinner at his place. It's a sweet little you know ten twelve top, very intimate you know very high end for the area. And um, we sat down and we ordered um, sausage trio uh, th- th- three ways, and it was my uh, my oldest that ordered it. And before he even tucked into it, he said, "And what is in each of these?" I couldn't have, like, I, seriously, I think my heart exploded in my chest. I'm like, holy shit, kid, yes! Um, but just to, you know, to see kids be aware of what they're putting into their bodies. My, my, my oldest, again, not to go on about him, has actually not necessarily chastised, but told his friends, you know, why are you drinking a soda? You know, why not have water? Like, crazy shit that I wouldn't have brought up when I was a kid, but I think the culture and being... You know, parents and a society that nurture that, uh, that's huge. I, I can't i can't even begin to grasp how much of an influence you're going to have on how many little minds. That's amazing to me. Just amazing. Um, Thank you. And, I, I mean, right now, I haven't really started on the educational program mm-hmm. for, for, for two major reasons. One is I first need to get the hot lunch program where it needs to to be, sure. um, and that has been very exciting for me because um, I've never actually cooked for kids like this. It's like a huge transition for me mm-hmm. to, you know, go from restaurant, you know, a la carte menu to um, a menu that kids will eat, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to figure out a way to, I mean, I'm, I'm hiding vegetables, but I'm also not. Um, and I think that, uh, I need to do both. I, I served eggplant Parmesan on Friday Uh and every single kid that came to the window was like, I don't eat eggplant. And I was like, just eat, just try it. Uh You know, if you Uh try it, then, then we're all good, you know? And it's amazing how many kids actually liked it and actually tried it. And when they don't try, I mean, when they try it and they don't like it, I I say thank you so much for trying it. You know, right. it means a lot for, that you tried it. You right. know, right? Um, so I'm I'm feeling really creative um, in a new way because I'm cooking with grains and vegetables in a certain way that I have never cooked before, sure. and I'm working on that. And then I'm working on educating and networking myself so that I can start to sneak my way into the curriculum slowly but surely because yeah. the biggest thing that I want is that I don't just want to come in and do a project once. You know, I don't want to just uh, teach children how to uh, conserve water with the fourth graders and then the fourth graders go and, and that was it. Right. My The biggest thing is that an, a manual needs to be created so that it, it's an ongoing thing and um I am networking, and it turns out that San Diego has a, a beautiful network of people who are already way ahead of this game, and I am, you know, realizing that um, it takes a village, and I'm really, really excited to learn myself about the this world that I'm not an expert in, and to bring it back to the school. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, and... Uh, uh, again, I, I just, it, it's, it's gotta be such a, it, it's a shift, but it's rewarding in such a unique way. Now take it back to the kids. Now, again, having, having three, I know what a difficult situation it can be to get them to eat well, but I almost think that once you start them eating well, I think they want to eat more and more well and become more and more adventurous. Have you found that with some of the ones who maybe up front turned a dish away, but now they're starting to come around? Yeah, I think it's trust. Yeah. You know, I think that um, once they realize that it's an, a con- I've made the environment where they eat a very friendly environment, I don't shame on them when they don't like it. I reward them when they try the food. And I um, I think that, yes, uh, they are slowly but surely liking every meal more. Um, even though it's still the same kind of thing, they're getting more comfortable with that setting. So um, I, when I talk to their parents, 
some of the parents have said to me, wait, are you sure you're talking about so-and-so? <laughs> you know, my story doesn't mix, you know, with the kid that they know in, at home. Like, are you sure, sure that my child tried the zucchini? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And, yeah, I mean, to to have the parents – because having, having been an educator myself, I know sometimes – um, some of the hardest parts involved with education are the parents, but it sounds like they're being really receptive. I mean, how 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 the hell could they complain? Let's be fair here. Chef Giselle Wellman all of a sudden is their <laughs> kid's executive chef. Come on, who's bitching about that? Nobody. Um, no. But... Yeah, I mean, I got a lot of at first when I was telling people, um, I I did feel a little bit like, oh, why why are you doing that? Like kind of like you're insinuating that something negative happened in my career. And then that's why I took a step down and decided to be the lunch lady. And very confidently from day one, I, I mean, I took this job for two major reasons. A, um, I've been looking for balance for a really long time Mm -hmm. and I love and support the fact that this job has allowed me to have a balanced lifestyle. I'm, I'm out of work every day around four. Um, I go to the gym every day. So me, myself, I'm, I'm living a better lifestyle, which I think is really important and a lifestyle that I hope we can get all chefs to live because it's non-existent for most chefs. And then two, I, I have, I'm so confident about this place that I have found and this new, I, I just think that it's, um, I, I don't know if you remember that my aunt, I don't know if, if we go back to the story or when you first met me, mm-hmm. um, I said that I had trouble on Top Chef because I lost my aunt. Yes. Um, oh my God. Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. you were doing the wedding, right? The wedding challenge. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So my aunt used to work in this school. Um, she oh, was wow. the lunch lady. Um, she worked for the executive chef. So she was just kind of, she did her own catering business and she worked as kind of a line cook during the day. And I have kind of circled around and it just feels like she has placed me in this place to better wow. something that she couldn't do. And I feel very, very good about this decision. And if you're listening and don't feel very, very good about that story, you're a cold-hearted <laughs> jerk. All right? I'm putting that out there. I literally I literally had to just click mute and go, oh. Like, I had a moment there. That's ridiculous. But, no, man, all, all things happen for a reason. Without getting, like, terribly cliche or anything like that. You know, I've I've known more people. I've been that person who, you know, has maybe taken a questionable move and had people be like, well, why? Well, I'm just not happy. And if I'm not happy, then, you know, what is the point of existence? Happiness is a choice. It's not just an emotion you experience. And for you, you know, to hear this and, you know, without sounding stalkerish, one, I was able to call back and know that that was the wedding challenge. So maybe that's a little creepy. I don't know. (laughs) But honestly, I was going to, I've been thinking, and I'll say it now. You sound like you have a new stroke of life in you. It you, you you just sound energetic and vibrant and into it. And whether that be your aunt, whether that be your choice, uh, it's it's so well deserved. So well deserved. Thank you. Yeah, man. they do say that in order for you to make change, you need to make room for change. Yep. And I think that part, the making room for change, mm-hmm. quitting my job without a job, and really not under knowing what the next step was, but knowing that I had to get myself into education or inspiring the new generation, yeah. and I didn't know how I was going to do it, yeah. was the scariest thing I've done so far in my career. <laughs> oh, dude, how could, it, how, how could it not be? I mean, honestly, and I, I'll, t- I, I'll tell you what, I'll relate something personal for you here. We're, we're going personal at 30 minutes in. Hold on tight, people. Um <laughs> Back back on uh, May thirty first, actually, um, I was uh, due to budgetary issues, let go from my gig of twelve and a half years. And June first, I was the happiest I'd ever been. 
And, like, I didn't know what was coming next. I, I hope something was. But I'm right there with you in that pocket in that making that room, finally pushing that hand. Like, it, it's almost like a bad relationship sometimes, you know. And I'm not saying your relationship with Pacific Standard was, was bad. But if you're being that rushed, that burnt, that, you know, scorched – but you don't want to necessarily voluntarily walk away from it because you've made this thing. It's this thing. You can't walk away from it. You can't quit, quitter, you know. But I think you got to. I mean, listening to yeah. you, honestly, it's it's inspiring to hear how happy you are. Thank you. Yeah. And, well, and when you talk about quitting, um, one of the things I've also, you know, kind of learned um, in this whole thing is that we come from a generation of our – parents and grandparents probably saying to us, never give up, never give up, never give up. Yeah. And uh, I think we were taught that if we gave up, we were losers right. and we yeah. were not successful and that isn't good. And I have realized lately that giving up certain things in life allows us to be much more free and allows new things to come in. So yeah. I'm not telling everyone to give up and Um, but you know, to be less hard on yourself when things don't go as planned, because there is a bigger plan out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you say, I'm, I'm sorry you got let go of your job, but you're, you know, it's given you a whole new life that you probably would have never made room for. Yep. I'm sorry. I probably should have bounced back in with, you know, it's okay. Something fell right back into place. I should have probably let you know that I'm stringing you along on the pity train there. (laughs) You said that in July you were in the happiest yeah, place. So yeah. I figured. Yeah. I, I figured because when you know when we're educated individuals, when we're driven, yep. things always fall into place. So when we teach our our youth to never give up, we should yep. probably be te- teaching them to be you know devoted and to be passionate and to be driven. Mm-hmm. And as long as you have those things, then things will come your way. You know, if you're sitting on your couch and you're not doing anything and you're just expecting things to walk in the door. Well, then, yep. you know, you should probably never give up whatever you're doing. <laughs> Man. Because it's not going to come. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of those kids, my God, did they stand to gain a lot from you. That's incredible. What, what an incredible person to have in the position. What an incredible presence to have, you know, in it. And, you know, r- r- right now with the Hot Lunch program in action, and then you're going to be transitioning to the education. I mean, we're – where do you see this going? Once once you've established what it is you want to establish, talk to me about you know the future. Obviously, you are literally a human heart with legs, and I think that's so awesome to just hear such a you know such an emotional approach to what should be a practical thing. Like you know, as a parent, we send our kids to school. We assume you know if they're buying that day, they're going to get a lunch. But to hear a presence like yours behind it and potentially driving this whole new program, like. What is it you want to do at the end of the day? Give yourself, you know, two, three, five years. What do you want to see done at the San Diego Jewish Academy? Well, I want to become a model for other schools. And I want to eventually almost hand over a Bible, or in this case, because it's the Jewish Academy, a Torah. I see what you did there. (laughs) (laughs) To other schools to follow and to be part and um obviously i am i'm this is a private school that i go to so um the it's a little bit different than well it's it's a little bit different than public school but i would love to eventually make this a big thing for the san diego public school system and um i just think that there's so much to go with it and um i i'm glad that you brought up my instagram because mm-hmm. I really want the Instagram to be a way of contact to, to the growth of this project. And I hope that in the future I, you know, I, I either write a book. I was thinking about some sort of kid-friendly teaching with the Modern Lunch Lady book series. Um, oh, my God, yes. So if, I- <laughs> if, if, if you don't go teaching cookbook on this, I'm going to be pissed at you. I don't know that that matters to you, but I'm going to be pissed off. (laughs) No. So I I just think that there's so much more. And, you know, as a young chef, you you always have this, when I grow up, I'm going to be an executive chef. And then, you know, you have all these goals. And I think that the most difficult thing for me was 
as I hit all these goals so young, I hadn't figured out my next goal. Um, I didn't know what to do after being an executive chef. Um, getting a Michelin star was never actually on one of my goals, um, which I, I very much uh, look up to every single person that has a Michelin star, but that wasn't what was fulfilling me. And finally, I have found this little niche that I hope to inspire other really talented people who are maybe looking for more balance in their life and maybe feel the same way that I felt in a restaurant. Because it's like, I hear a lot of stories about chefs that go work at a restaurant and then they just, it wasn't for them. And then they kind of end up doing sales or they end up, you know, in a completely different environment. And I'm saying, don't get out of it. Don't get out of the kitchen world. Figure out a way to make a difference. Figure out a way, find your niche to make you happy. And maybe you can also make a difference. You know, I hope that I inspire other chefs that, uh, are talented, passionate, and, you know, in other cities to kind of do the same thing. I love it. I love it. I love it. So you, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just a beautiful start. I mean, you're, you're literally at the beginning of your new gig. That's, got, yeah. that's such a cool place to be. I'm sure of it. Yeah. It, I, um, it kind of almost feels like getting, kind of starting all over because yeah. I... Obviously, I know how to cook, so mm. the day-to-day kitchen operation feels like, you know, looking, what is what is that saying, like the back of my hand, whatever. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the next thing that I'm about to encounter uh-huh. is so new for me, and on, like, this week, no, next week, I'm going to a sustainability conference, um, and I'm just really, really excited to start learning about things that I'm passionate about but just haven't had the time to really go nose dive in and, and make a difference with. Yeah, yeah. and I'm sure... And may I say yep. that the networking in, the, in this community, in the community of farmers, in the community of people who really work hard and get down and dirty and are trying every single day to make a difference, they're the nicest, kindest, most, most humble people I've ever met and I can't believe it took me so long to start networking with these kind of people. I am just so excited to be part of this amazing community. Well, you've got the time now. There are four o'clock. You're good to go. You can make time for that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, farmers are really into pizza parties on their farms. And um, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's it's so lovely that, you know, they... It's just a really lovely community. That's awesome. That's awesome. Anybody, a- a- any farms, any names you want to plug? Just um, Wise, Chino Farms, um, Willow. What is it? Wild 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 Willow. Um, I don't know. They're all San Diego farms. Awesome. But um, uh, I don't know. I think it's all farms. <laughs> yeah. I, I I I think that we need to start paying. There should be a reality TV series on farmers, and <laughs> we should start making them celebrities. Because, I, you know, they work really, really hard. I like that. You heard it. Top chef, top farmer. I top think so. Farmer. <laughs> I love it. Calicchio, get at us. You heard it here. Giselle Woman, <laughs> Sean Rossler, co-hosts. We got this. All day. <laughs> awesome. 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 Well, I'll tell you what, Giselle. I... Certainly, and I'm sure anybody with half a brain listening to this as well, wishes you only the best and the greatest success humanly possible um, in your new gig as executive chef at the San Diego Jewish Academy. So, um, as as well, always... Thank you again yeah. for having me. It's so great to talk to you. It's very easy to to have these you don't make me know you make me a little nervous but i'm not that nervous listen to this i I better not make you nervous man you you stood across from big people i'm just some big oaf in central pennsylvania so man no thing at all thank you thank you so much and again san diego jewish academy folks if you're interested you can check them out www.sdja.com be sure to check out giselle's new gig on instagram at the modern lunch lady um and again uh 
episode 63, Giselle Wellman, the new executive chef of the San Diego Jewish Academy. Thank you so very much. Uh, my, my producer, as always this evening, has been the lovely, voluptuous Johnny Leland Robinson, a.k.a. the Reverend Johnny Lamoria. Be sure to check out all his gigs, um, all his Insta, Facebook, awesome things. And next episode will be number 64. Be sure to check it out. Take care. Hey,